you don't have a test deposit, it's CC. There are standard test deposits with my session. The exception is that we take a random sequence and attend it to the beginning of the meeting. As you can see here for, you know, some data sets that we want to review two test deposits. Then we do adapter training, take a few commands that are kind of ridiculous. The, the basic problem is that we've observed that at a very low range, so 0.1%, even less on that order, there are adapter numbers that make it through uh, into our library. The problem is that 500 reads is not very many, but if they all match the same percentage, you only create a really good multiple positive. And so what we wanted doing was sort of erring on the side of overturning, and so we wanted to do a bunch of training steps um, using basically shifted versions of the adapters, because we also found that cut-adapt by default is very bad at dealing with five-time transitions um, if you're looking for basically double adapters. So I'm happy to talk about getting on the source, I'm happy to talk about offline, um, but just be careful with the adapter training because it can be a problem. Um, so the next step is dependent on the removal. The CF appears that even for a really good data set, still probably 10 to 20% of the reason that you have some RNA, and then you can get higher. And in the ideal world, those are just maps to the rest of RNA transcripts, and if you don't them, in reality, they might have added to genes all over the place and create really good false positive signals again. So to alleviate this for general processing, we first map to rep base, remove all those reads of maps to rep base, and only take the remaining ones to see those through uh, to genome mapping. We have some repetitive elements for analysis tools um, that I can talk about later, and we're interested, but for general processing, that's what we do. We try to get rid of repetitive elements, um, so we're always then we do standard mapping with SAR, um, same way we have on the data we map to the genome, uh, to the transcriptome, so the genome plus response to the database, that's the uniquely mapped So then, so if you study with removal, um, if you're familiar with chip, uh, chip or RNA-seq, many people just use the SPAR and stop positions of mapping. Because we have the randomers, we can actually do better than that, and so we take reads that map to the same location, and have the same uh, randomers sequence, and we discard those, you know, anything more than one that has the same randomers sequence we start. Um, and so the pair, the, the BAM file that is on the CC is the output of this standard removal that only contains uniquely mapped, non-repetitive, non-PCR duplicate reads. So to give you an example of what that looks like for an average data set, um, so, for some of the older clip methods, you can see that you know, at all time you can get some reasons that are too short, so there's anything with that from the sequence on there that's started. We usually see on the order of 10 to 20% mapping to repetitive elements, so there may be 10% that doesn't need to match the genome. But the real, and the real advantage of our, our improved clip methodology is that the number of PCR duplicates that we all see is very low, whereas a lot of older clip protocols, you just got an enormous level of PCR duplication. So across, um, now it's just going across think, about 300 encoded clip experiments, you can see the fraction of usable reads basically this green, or this green over this green in this gray. Most of the time with e-clip are now in the 90% uh, need, whereas most published clip data sets are more like 5 or 10% non-PCR duplicates. Okay, so um, again, very quickly, the damn files, and you see the standard damn files, except again, that random are still on the weekend, just in case you want to use it for uh, something. Okay, so to call cheats, um, this is something that's still a little bit of work in progress. You can actually take our data and call use it for, like, many standard CCP colors. Um, they have to be strand aware, so it mess up a little bit, but the way that we actually call cheats usually is to use cl uh, the calling algorithm called Clipper. It was developed in our lab a few years ago. The idea is it identifies regions that are significantly rich above the transcript that it's in. So even the transcript, the transcript can vary by orders of a thousand-fold expression, so we're looking for regions that show higher, higher binding than the average level of that transcript. Uh, so Clipper does that. We then take the Clipper output uh, and then compare those against that pair size matching clip. Um, very simply, we just, um, so very simply, we just literally just take that T-call T-region, region, get the number of reads in the clip, get the number of reads in the input, do a very simple distance test to determine the full distance significance. So this is not usually done in clip, um, but for shift, I mean, you guys are all very familiar with it's important. For clip, we saw that it was really, again, enormously important. So even if we saw something like SLTP, which is exclusive to RNA, system RNA, it's been very well studied, very well characterized. Um, we actually see basically RNA sequencing coverage at a bunch of each, so we take ES2. Um, the input and SLTP clip will almost exactly the same. As you can already see, we need actually to show a little bit of binding on these testons. So it's not that everyone looks exactly the same, it's just that you always get some local background. But if you take the SLTP clip and now actually plot the read density in input versus the full Clip, you can see that the systems are all very, very rich. So if there isn't just a flat, you know, level of all backgrounds in every clip experiment, you can really just want to normalize the way that the regions are rich in the relative input. And so for each of the teeth, so these are two examples. Uh, one example of a region that's actually not enriched, so the D12 small RNA, shows up as a fairly common artifact in almost every clip data set. Um, it you know, has a lot of reads, it's a reach per million of 500, so it's a lot of reads. But if you actually compare it to the input, it's actually defeated uh, in this clip. Whereas if you're coming into the system RNA, it's something like 2 to the 9th enriched. So this is actually very clean, you just have to do the proper normalization to get rid of those false positives. So, so the key thing to note then is if you download these non-peak files from the CC, these are input normalized peaks, but actually contain every clip called peak, including ones that are not enriched, and even including ones that are depleted in the clip relative to the input. So if you send a bit file, you might have the region, it has the permission, but then it has these two columns here of log 2 full enrichment and minus log 10 t value. Um, and so, you know, these ones all have to be enriched, and if you go down the sort of list, you'll start to get ones that are actually full enrichment is negative. Um, and so we provide those to people, we provide those all for you know, analysis purposes. In some cases, for example, for IDR, they're actually very useful because you need uh, not enriched peaks uh, to run something like IDR. Um, we also provide it for people who set their own cutoffs and do their own trade-offs and specificity versus specificity, um, but it's going to leave that up to you. We standardly use uh, 10 to 5th and basically default enrichment as sort of a stringent criteria. It seems to work pretty well at removing uh, false positives. Um, there are definitely real signals below that, but it works pretty well for us in getting a good high quality set of peaks, usually on order of hundreds of thousands per team, um, that really doesn't have very many false positives. Okay, so very quickly, I'm just going to a couple of highlights of what we can do now, um, the kind of analyses that people can think about using instead of four. Um, so we have, you know, the, the most simplest one is individual RDP analyses. So for individual RDP, this is an example here in the box two. You know, we can ask questions like, what are the peaks that are enriched um, at all binding sites, or only at binding sites, and introns, and proximal introns, and different like TRs. We can ask, where are the peaks for this RDP? This case, we do the box two. It's very heavily enriched in proximal and introns, relative to MRA or genomic background. We can even ask things like, where along the pre MRA or uh, MRA are just RDP down. Um, in this case, it has a little bit of a five time distribution that you can see in red here on pre MRA. Exons are kind of flat, but each one tends to be very rich near the five-dimensional site. So we can ask very simple questions. And then, in addition to the clip, we can start to look at other resources. So we integrate this with RDP 
two localizations, give us a different replicate lens, and you can see the plus two in their data is basically with a little bit of satisfaction for really double nuclear and actually exclusively pop ship a nuclear signal. So we can also integrate that with RNA seek data to create these special sorts of RTG maps or spiking maps. So the idea here is to say, okay, if we look at exons that are differentially regulated by plus two, where does plus two line near them? So in this case in blue, exons are included upon RB uh, plus two knockdown, tend to have more plus two lining here, whereas RB uh, uh that are excluded upon RB plus two knockdown, you get a risk of the binding projectiles here. So we can build these maps and all sorts of different maps for additional RPTs. Um, in the lab, we're also building these RNA centric views of RNA processing. So the idea here is that we can basically do an empirical screen to identify RPTs that potentially regulate RNA interests. Um, so here's just two examples. So 7SK is a very well studied uh, small nuclear RNA. In this case, we take all the data sets that most enriched is about 7, so no number of complex, so it works very nicely. We did this for exist, and it turned out that the top four for exist all actually matched recently published results from uh, germ studies, so we pulled down the match that uh, proceeds associated with exist. And you can hear just by sorting by clip enrichment, you immediately pull out RPTs that have very specific localization patterns on exist. So this actually works very nicely to pull out potential regulators from an RPT of interest. Um, this is something that we're building as a resource for the community. Um, we're also building, uh, and this is uh, another tool we're building, so this is just a DM browser track that literally just has every binding site for every RPT um, totally differently. So this is the entire exist transfer. If we zoom in here now to the 3.0 exist, you can see that there's a whole bunch of RPTs binding here. This is one example, but all of these different colors are different RPTs that show some significant enrichment, uh, significant enrichment data enrichment. So I think these are going to be useful tools for people to just ask questions about uh, the info data. And finally, we can do, you know, we can ask questions, very global questions about RPT binding. Uh, so for example, here, we can just cluster all the data sets by what types of RNA they find. We very quickly pull out clusters of, for example, external RNA binders, uh, internal binders, and user binders, etc. So we start to defer what an RPT is doing based on both specific analysis general properties of its binding profiles. Okay, so, so what's available? So all the data is on the code GCC that's all available. You can download it and, and use it. Um, we are in the process of moving our processing pipeline to DNA access. That should be done in July ish. So that should be available for people to use very soon. Um, the initial processing pipeline is the first step. It should be followed very quickly by bringing our IDRs or QC pipelines also as well, um, which we developed to very quickly QC uh, data sets as part of the code. Um, we're building a browser to do these RNA-centric queries with a website that can handle like 10 people looking at it right now. So it's definitely not ready for this. Um, but that should be available soon and let people basically do the same thing showing to say that an RNA or a recent interest and get the RPT to find there. Um, we're also in the process of integrating with the code cycle and, and these sort of technical summaries for RPT is now to serve profile. For RPT was a very quick summary of what the data shows for that RPT. Um, so with that, I will thank uh, Gene, um, our code group. So, uh, Brian, Chris. Uh,
Amen.